Um, well, I'm Jamie Johnson with DeltaWare again, and I really appreciate everybody uh, taking the time to spend the whole day with us here today. And I did want to introduce um, the, uh, the closing speaker that we have, uh, someone who is uh, one of the founders of Actual Tech Media, which is one of the companies that is supporting us here in our endeavors today. Um, he's going to be talking about the changing business IT landscape and structure. Um, could you give a round of applause for Mr. Scott Lowe? Thank you. Thank you for that smattering of applause. Just kidding. So we're going to talk a little bit about what's changing in business IT. Some of this is going to be familiar, though, because you're going to hear some of this, and you're going to go, but, but that's the way it's always been. But we're going to see kind of what needs to change in order for organizations to really realize their full potential moving forward. But I want to tell you a little bit about me. Um, I am a co-founder co of Actual Tech Media. We are a content creation and analyst firm that works with technology companies. So a lot of the companies in the other room are our clients. Um, I spent 10 years of my career as a CIO. I've been doing IT since 94. I'm an author, speaker, analyst, consultant. I do a lot of consulting for colleges and universities around IT strategy and a number of other things. So I do a little bit of everything. Sometimes when my wife says, where are you going this week? And what are you going to do? I say, I have no idea, because sometimes I just can't remember. So we're going to talk about this thing in four ways. First of all, we're going to talk about evolving business expectations. What's changing in the business? Then we're going to talk about IT resourcing. And we're going to talk about budgets and the people problem. Then we're going to end with some emerging technologies that are hitting the market to help you. How many of you hate the phrase, do more with less? Now, when you hear that phrase, how many of you want to walk up to the person who said it, wrap your hands around their neck, and just squeeze? Anybody? OK, I saw some hands go up. See, that's a, some kindred spirits in the room. Unfortunately, it's a reality, but we'll talk about that as we move on. So you guys ever see that before? Right? Is it kind of frustrating when you have to watch that spinny ball? Anybody get frustrated when you see that when you're trying to load a web page or go to a YouTube video or something? Right? Or when you're waiting for an application to, you know, you just want it to finish, right? Well, one of the challenges with technology today is that the business is increasingly impatient when it comes to what IT can do. Would anybody agree with that statement? That How many of you have the business when they want something, they come to you and say, look, this is really important. We have to do this, but just take your time. Anybody have that problem? No. They want it now, right? And then they're going to say, oh, by the way, we're not going to increase your budget or give you more people to do it, right? So, Unfortunately, though, we're in a situation where reality struck, and we have to figure out ways that we can support these emerging needs of the business in a way that makes sense and that satisfies what the business needs to grow. One of the, you're going to hear lots of buzz phrases in the next couple of years, too. One of the things that's happening already is digital. How many of you heard the phrase digital transformation yet? Anybody know what it means? Yeah. Is that, who said that? That's the exact right answer, whatever you want it to mean. Basically, what it means, though, is that enterprises are looking for ways that they can provide a more seamless infrastructure environment and business environment to make it easier for customers and suppliers and everyone else to interact with what they do. So they're looking at ways that they can use IT systems to really streamline what they've done. It's the, a new take on business process improvement, business process reviews, things like that but also with a huge dash of integration thrown in and a bunch of other things. We also see a need for enhanced time to value. And that goes back to that spinny slide before. The business doesn't want to make a massive investment in an IT operation and then have to wait two years to see a return on, on that investment. How many of you have CFOs that like money? <laughs> yeah, right? What's that? Got You've got one? OK. Well, at least one in the room's got that. So, they want to be able to see a time to value for what, they're, what they've bought. They want to be able to see a return on that investment sooner rather than later. And they want to see some new things. Now, we've been talking about business intelligence and analytics for a while. But as time goes on, and we see even more and more things like smart devices, I, I, I don't like the phrase Internet of Things. What's the phrase? What's, what are we talking about? It? The insecurity of things? Um, you know, things like that. Um, but lots of new constant streams of data. We're going to see businesses that are drowning in data. And we see lots of people saying, we're going to capture every possible data point that we can from our customers, and then we're going to do something with it. Now, what that something is, they don't always know. 
They just know they want to capture all this data and then they want to do something with it. How many of you work in organizations that capture tons of data and they don't always know what to do with it? See, I like, you guys are honest. That's sometimes unusual. Sometimes people just sit there and say, no, we're perfect, but you know. There you go. We pay for storage for it. We're, doing, we're leveraging that data perfectly. Now, at the same time, though, as we look at everything we're doing, we have a situation where data breaches are a serious thing. So we're storing all this data, but then when we have a problem, we see relatively significant costs associated with a potential breach. So if you look at a cost of a stolen record, if you're stolen, storing all this customer information, the cost from 2015 to 16 for re, in repair, whatever it takes to correct the situation, has risen from 154 to $158 per stolen record. So if you lose, you know, if, if somebody steals 100,000 records from your system, that's at least $100, right? It's, it's math, right? So, um, so we're seeing, all this stuff that we have to do with the business, they want to do more with analytics, they want to do more with business intelligence, but we also have to think about securing that. Now, when your business units come to you and say, we want to do this and we want to do it right now, how many of them, how many of them tell you also, but we have to make sure it's secure? Probably none of them, right? Somebody has to think about that sort of stuff. When we look at why breaches happen, it happens because in a lot of cases, people are in a hurry. They're trying to get things done. Now, in less than half of cases is the root cause of a data breach actually a malicious attack. In like 25%, somebody made a mistake. And in 27%, someone made a mistake because there is no such thing as a system glitch, right? When it comes to data law, uh, data security. That means that someone made a mistake somewhere. So really when you think about it, 52% of your people have made a mistake here that have caused security issues. We also have new security challenges. Last week, you guys heard about all the websites that were down, right? So it was like Reddit, which that means no more cat pictures. Um, we saw a bunch of other sites affected, right? <clears throat> that was caused, I don't know if any of you saw this, out of a massive botnet of Internet of Things connected devices, from a, and it was a Chinese firm's devices, their, um, their cam uh, cameras and DVRs, were compromised, and they created a massive botnet and they took down the Dyn DNS service, which is really what, what made everything go offline because there was no more DNS for it. And that's generally considered bad, right? When you see a huge swath of the internet taken out in one morning. And I heard this morning when I was talking to somebody that they only had, they only put in, um, into service 10% of the potential capacity of what they could have flooded the internet with last week. So, they could have made it 10 times worse, but for whatever reason they chose not to, which I guess is good. So, how many of you work in smaller organizations? How, of, keep your hands up. Now put your hands down if you're not 24 by seven by 365, in some way, shape, or form. A good chunk of you left your hands up, but you're probably, you can throw your hands down now. Um, you probably have people that work generally nine to five, you know, even in small organizations. And then overnight, though, you might have other people doing smaller things, customers hitting your website, things like that. We're looking for, in every organization, from the smallest of organizations to the largest, 24-7, 365 operations. I'm sorry that color is a little hard to read. We want to time, they want to minimize downtime, they want to uh, make sure that things stay available for customers, and we have to make sure that we actually fully understand all the costs that go into downtime. So, IT is being told you're too slow, but make sure when you do all this stuff, you think about all these things. The business and the business units don't think about these things, but we have to, right? How many of you love your job? Good, that's good. Now we also see people in IT saying, what are our real problems? We actually um, surveyed, I think it was like a thousand IT pros around the world, and asked them, what are some of your uh, key priorities in the next 12 to 18 months? And a couple of them really are important. Well, they're all important. But you see that improving disaster recovery and improving data backup and recovery were very much at the top of the list. Again, these are things that when business units are looking for new initiatives, they don't always consider. There's another ancillary piece that has to be brought, in the, brought into the equ equation with all these things, right? Well, anytime you deploy a new service, we have to think about how we're gonna protect that service and how we're gonna back it up, 
right? Who loves to back everything up? Who loves backup? Anybody? Do you? You really do? What do you do? What's your job? Is it backup administrator? No? Do you love backup? How do you back things up? Just curious. So, are you work for Unitrends? OK. Anybody from Unitrends in the room? OK, we'll have to make sure they get you the sticker that they owe you. <laughs> um, no, it's good stuff. Unitrends is good stuff. What's that? I actually just recommended to an, uh, a client, because I do consulting as well, that they deploy Unitrends, and they freaking love it. <clears throat> um, it's just they put the appliance in, and it was basically set it and forget it. So the new normal for IT, and maybe this has been the normal for a long time, uh, is better, faster, cheaper, right? We want things to be better. We want them to be more robust than they ever have been. IT has to be faster at deploying things. Oh, and by the way, we're not going to give you any more money to do it. Speaking of which, let's talk about the budget. So this is not, you see that? That's not an error. According to um, Computer Economics Incorporated, 2016-17 survey of uh, CIOs, for the last three years, there's been no growth in IT capital budgets. How many of you have seen something similar? You don't know? OK, we'll let it go this time. No, it's no problem. Now, on the IT operating side of the budget, we're seeing a slowdown in the rate of growth in the IT budget, 2% for 2016. How many of you saw a budget decrease this year? How many of you saw a budget increase? Any, nobody saw a budget increase? You did? Was it significant? 8%? OK, that's good. That's more than two, right? One carry the three. Yeah. It is. And IT staffing is on hold. So we see 35% of respondents say that there's been no change in their IT staff. And we see 19% say that we've decreased. And I mean, that leaves a good chunk that have increased. But the majority of IT organizations are decreasing or staying the same as far as staff counts go. And this is the same time that we're seeing the budgetary pressure and increasing pressure from the business. How many of you actually do feel like that the pressure from the business has increased in the past three or four years? How many of you stress out about that a little bit? How many of you really just don't give a crap? <laughs> now, when we ask CIOs, what's the adequacy of your operating budget? Now, obviously, CIOs are biased, right? I mean, when I was a CIO, and I was asked, is your budget enough? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say, oh, we've got more than enough money, because that would be stupid, right? Because um, then they're going to take it away, and we're going to have to cut things. But when we see people saying that they're very inadequate or somewhat inadequate, which is 60% of respondents, that makes it hard for IT, for the CIOs, to actually align their operations with the, with the expectations of the business are. There's a mismatch somewhere in alignment. And we've heard for a decades about this divide between the business and IT. And for some reason, it's always blamed on IT. IT is the problem. Well, when the budgets are not sufficient to meet the needs of the business, there's a problem on both sides. right? We have to figure out a way to solve this moving forward. So at the same time, of all the, as we see all this, we're being told we want to we do more. We want to do business intelligence. We want to do mobile services. We want to digitize our environments, like I said before. Now again, our budgets are flat, staffing is flat, but what do all these things entail? If you're going to do analytics, you need lots of CPU. If you're going to do a lot in the way of dig, you know, digitizing services and other things, you're going to need more storage. You're going to need more resources to support all these things that the business wants to do. So where are we? Budgets are stagnant. We have flat staffing, and we have new workloads. And that's the end of my pre no, I'm kidding. Um, so we have to fix it. We have to do something inherently different in IT to be able to address some of these things. But we have a situation where the scarcity of IT resources means that we have to reduce time spent on core maintenance and services. We have to find a way to, who wants to say it? That's the unfortunate phrase, right? And it is possible to do more with less today in a lot of what we're seeing in the, in the environment. Now, how many of you work in large organizations that are um, siloed? How many of you like that? 
You know, I, asked, I actually ask that question every time I do a speaking engagement. And in the last two years, I've done 60 speaking engagements. I've literally had one person raise their hand and say, I love that because I get to control my turf. And it's like, that's the wrong answer. But um, nobody likes it, but it's the, way we, it's the way things are just because of the way our infrastructures are built. We're looking for people that have holistic skill sets. That's what CIOs and IT decision makers are looking for today. People that aren't just storage administrators, aren't just server guys, aren't just X, whatever it happens to be. We're looking for people that are well-rounded, have the ability to communicate, industry experience, and can leverage data and analytics to help make their job better. But we have to have underlying infrastructure that can help us with that too, which we'll talk about shortly. And let's talk about what we do traditionally from an infrastructure perspective. Well, first of all, we buy servers. How many of you buy servers? Anybody buy servers? Right? Then we buy storage, right? Then we buy network stuff, whatever it happens to be. Then we buy software, like a hypervisor and operating systems and things like that. We buy all this stuff separately. We do a proof of concept, make sure it all works together. And then we deploy it and manage it individually. But the problem is that each one of these things requires a specialized set of skills in some way, shape, or form, right? There is some overlap, and especially in smaller organizations, it's easier um, to overlap these. We have to think about the people side of this. Every time you do something, you have to add more people. So we basically procure the environment, then we deploy it and configure it, and then we test it. And if it doesn't work, we go back to the beginning and try to figure out what's wrong. Has anybody ever had a situation where a vendor said, that's not my, our problem, that's the other vendor's problem? Anybody ever had vendor finger pointing? How many of you enjoyed that experience? How many of you wanted to beat them up after school and take their lunch money? Okay, yeah, that's frustrating, right? We need to get rid of that. Now also, as you scale those kinds of environments, well, they don't always, go great, you have to add people to do those sorts of things. And what did we see, whoops. Ah. Businesses don't really wanna have to add people all the time. They're not adding IT people now, they're not adding budget spend now. So again, we have to find ways that we can bring the environment more in line with what is reasonably uh, possible with regard to the business. Yes. Yeah, in fact, that's a really good point. Uh, anybody, know, everybody, anybody not know what shadow IT means? Okay, so shadow IT is a phenomenon in which IT spend and IT services are being deployed from within business units without knowledge or even, or sometimes without knowledge and some, definitely without the consent of IT. Now, in some organizations, IT is not a command and control organization, so they don't have any influence over this. But what that tells me, is a couple things. One, um, first of all, I'll tell you a story. We, I helped a college a couple years ago deploy a new ERP, and during that process, they did an inventory of all their applications, and they discovered that they had a one, a, a 119 shadow IT applications outside central IT. Um, and the problem with shadow IT like that, where there's users that have deployed their own systems that aren't necessarily always well integrated, aren't well understood, is number one, if they're data systems, they don't match production data. So you have multiple versions of the truth about what's happening in the organization. Now, individual business units are making decisions based on what they consider to be good data. Now, if that data doesn't align, someone's not making a good decision, right? Second, there's security challenges there. Number that we've talked before that business units don't always understand the security implications of what they do. So if they go out and they buy Amazon Web Services stuff, or some SaaS application and then just download all your stuff into a CSV file and email it to a provider, um, that's a problem, right? Because we don't like that. And third, there's cost. You're losing the ability to engage in economies of scale um, because of the fact that we have so much IT spent happening outside IT. Now that's not gonna go away, but I'm sort of the mindset that the business needs to put governance policies in place that not necessarily prevent it, but help resource IT adequately to prevent it, if that makes sense. You can't just say we're not gonna do this anymore because the business units have to be able to do what they need to be able to do. But the business has to fund those somehow. What is your experience with that? Have you seen that happen? The shadow IT. No, I mean, are, you, are you in an organization where that's happening? Uh, not as bad as my previous life, but it's 
What happened in your previous life? I'm just curious. Uh, there were 14 different divisions, and each one of them had some type of general That's a problem. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have that problem? Nobody else except you? Used to. Used to, but you don't anymore. Oh, wait, somebody else say that? You did? Yeah. You don't anymore? In your current organization? Same organization. How'd you fix it? Cracked heads. What? Cracked heads. Cracked heads? Hospital visits? What? Got tough on people and said, no, this is not going to happen. I'll shut you down. Yeah. And I, I just took access away from them. Okay. That's the way it's going to be. Did the business do anything from a budget or governance perspective to try to help you with that, or did you just have to do it on your own? I started out on my own, and then I slowly got exceptions from, from those above me, and then it became part of the business that no. No more IT staff in, in different departments. It's going to be all centralized in IT. Got it. So in other words, since you got the buy-in from the people above you, the sort of policy slash governance came into play to help you with that. Yeah. And it's a huge problem. I mean, were you seeing security issues and budget issues and all that good stuff? And what was, what was the symptom that made you realize that this had to stop? Right. Right. So that was that was the major thing, and then the second was budget. Um, you know, because all of a sudden accounting would come back to me and say, "Hey, this bucket of your budget is enormous." Well, because all these people were buying whatever and then putting it in your budget. Code, which, because well, that's where software goes. Well, that's no good. No, that's where I buy software. Right. And what's your, are you the CIO? I'm just IT manager. Okay, well, same. I mean, it's a small organization? Yep. Okay. So, same deal, same, same role. I'm the highest IT person. Got it, okay. We'll come back to, I think we're going to come back to that in a little bit. Now, when we think about staffing again, though, when um, you think about who you need to hire, as you grow infrastructure, we look at having to add people to the infrastructure team, but that's not what the business is looking for. The business is looking for analysts and developers and things like that. Is that. Are you guys seeing that in your own organizations in some cases? They're looking for more business analyst type people and fewer infrastructure focused people? True? False? Okay. Anybody think it's false? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, it's false for you? You're just actually hiring more infrastructure people? What's your business? Um, County government? Okay. Okay. And this is not going to hold true for every 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 use case, obviously, but in general, people are looking for more business-facing IT help than they were in the past. I'm not crying. I have horrible allergies, by the way. Oh, I could just say I'm super passionate about this, but I really am not crying. But the other thing that's happening, and I live in a relatively rural area, and this is absolutely true where I live. It may not be as true here, but it can be hard to find people with the skills that you need at the price you're willing, your business is willing to pay, right? Anybody have trouble hiring good people with the right skills? Yeah. So what are some things that we're seeing on the emerging technologies front that are going to help us solve some of, these some of these challenges? So I'm not going to necessarily spend a lot of time on that again. But I want to talk about converged infrastructure for a second. Is anybody running what they would call, what you would consider a converged infrastructure system right now, like a vBlock or something? What are you running? Okay. Okay. Who else was? Someone else was? In the blue? Was that you? No? Well, we're going to go there next. Yeah. So when we think about our traditional infrastructure. We're buying all these pieces separately, and then we're putting them together, and then we're deploying them. And you know, it's good, but not great necessarily, because we're putting a lot of time up front in the deployment, making sure it all works. And then we end up in a situation where there's potentially vendor finger pointing. And it's not great. So conversion infrastructure vendors came on the market, and what they did is they said, we're going to sell you a rack. We're going to basically put everything into a rack, compute, storage, and networking, and as well as the hypervisor and everything. We're going to pre-cable and pre-validate and pre-test that rack, and then we're going to ship it to you, roll in your data center, and you're going to plug it in and go on your merry way. And that's pretty much the way these have operated. Is anybody running vBlock here? 
or Dell, uh, whatever the Dell one is, um, Active Systems, I guess it's called, um, HP something or other. I can't, I can't remember what they call theirs either. Um, but this is one way that they've tried to solve some of the vendor finger pointing issues because if there's a problem here, you call the vendor that sold you the rack. It doesn't matter what component's gone wrong, whether it's the network switch or whether it's the storage, whether it's disk or whatever. Basically, you call one phone number and they help you solve the problem. So what this does for us is it helps us to think, rethink how we deploy infrastructure. We can eliminate all of that initial upfront time we used to spend deploying and testing things, right? So the time to value for a solution drops dramatically. So we begin to realize the return on the investment very, very quickly compared to what we saw with traditional infrastructure. We also see other ways that we can get some value from um, what, we've been done, what we've done traditionally in IT. We get the ability to more rapidly virtualize our workloads because basically when you think about these converged infrastructure solutions, a lot of times they're gonna say, uh, when you buy this rack, this model, you can virtualize this many to this many virtual machines. You can have this many virtual machines in the environment. So you're gonna have an expectation for what you can um, actually run in the environment. And one of the challenges with some traditional environments is this predictable performance problem. We don't always know when we add discrete components what impact that's gonna have on other components in the environment. Now ease of deployment, easy. It's not much easier than plugging in a rack, right? When we think about converged infrastructure solutions. Because simplified support I mentioned, we're gonna move into a single vendor support model, in most cases, not all. And that's gonna help us avoid those vendor finger pointing issues and help us more quickly resolve problems when we actually do have uh, issues in the environment. And we get to modify the economics. We get to start thinking about immediate return on investment rather than having to wait for deployment to take place in a, in a, with a more traditional model. Now, who was running hyper, well, you, you were the hyper-converged dude, right? What are you running? SimpliVity, how do you like it? Pretty nice. Well, how many nodes do you have? How many cubes? Stack. Uh, seven, and two seven and two locations, 40 terabytes? Cool. Who else is running hyperconverged? What are you running? OK. So you guys, um, you guys work with Matt? Vote? He's a good guy, isn't he? Um, how many do you have? What's that? Four nodes. Four nodes, two locations. And they're backing each other up and everything? Who else? Anybody else doing hyperconverged? Who doesn't know what hyperconverged is? I'll explain it anyway, just in case. So when we think about converge, we're basically taking the off-the-shelf stuff that we had before. It was the same storage arrays, the same servers, the same networking switches, and we're just gonna put them in a rack for you. With hyperconverged, nothing's gonna be the same. You're gonna basically generally buy either just a software uh, tool that you can install on your own servers, or you're gonna buy nodes from a hyperconverged infrastructure vendor that combines compute, storage, networking in some cases, and a hypervisor into a package. Then when you wanna um, deploy, you basically just rack and stack these things and turn them on, and they create a single, single, uh, single shared resource pool that you can then pull resources from to deploy new workloads. So all the storage on all these nodes is aggregated, and then as you deploy new VMs, it just consumes the storage from the pool. If you need to grow the environment, if you have to add more VMs, you just add another node. And then basically it's automatically added to the um, existing resource pool, and you go on your merry way. So one of the nice things about hyperconverged infrastructure is, the, is, is often, in some, in some cases, the financial model, not all. So basically, you can often start with as few as two or three nodes, depending on the vendor. Like if you're a SimpliVity customer, you can start with two nodes. If you're Nutanix, it's a three node minimum. Um, this depends on the architecture. And with these systems, once you have two or three nodes, you've got enough, you can do full uh, availability, basically, in the environment. And two nodes is not super expensive, when you really think about it. So you can very granularly increase the amount of resources you're actually deploying to the environment. So if you think about that traditional buying model, we've actually often bought storage for how, well, when you buy storage right now, you're not thinking about what you need today. You're thinking about what you're gonna need in three to five years, right? Because that's your replacement cycle. So basically you're leaving a lot of money on the table for the next 
two to three to five years, depending on how long it takes you to actually grow into that storage. When you look at something like hyperconverged, you can actually much more easily buy what you need today and then grow tomorrow. So it's more, much more of uh, a pay-as-you-grow type model like you'd get with cloud than you would with traditional infrastructure. You also, in general, get a single point of support. So if you have something go wrong in the environment, you call the vendor and they will help you. Now at least with their, with their gear, that can help you with all the other stuff. And you get, you get much faster time to value. The time that it takes to deploy these things can be 15 minutes. It doesn't take that long to rack and stack pieces of equipment. How long did, for the guys running SimpliVity, how long did it take you to actually get up and running? Half a day? Of what? Two days of that initial replication? Yeah, so half a day to get up and running is pretty good for a complete environment. And how many, is that your entire environment or are you running it for just a specific application? That's everything? What did you have before? So you just, you didn't even have virtualization before? Really? Okay. What about you? Are you running everything on SimpliVity as well? Okay. You had that before and you migrated to SimpliVity. And did you get rid of the other stuff after that? So you're running everything on SimpliVity now. Okay, cool. So there's some real benefits to these sorts of solutions. And if you guys have to add more, you basically call SimpliVity and say, give me another one, right? Um, and the same thing is true of Nutanix, the same thing is true of uh, scale computing and all the other, how many hyper-converged infrastructure vendors are there out, are out there right now? Like five dozen, there's a ton of them. But they all have really good, uh, generally really good stories to tell around their, um, what they can potentially do for you. So there's also the cloud. How many, how many of you freaking hate this phrase? I'll raise my hand. You know, this is, as Steve mentioned earlier, this is the stupidest phrase ever. You know, when I, it's nothing but marketing crap, right? Back in um, 1999, remember the internet was the big thing, right? I mean, that was, we're gonna go on the internet. That was a long time ago. I went to Staples to buy a new computer desk and it said, internet ready computer desk. I'm like, seriously guys? Like, do you, do you know what that actually means? Which means nothing which is sort of what the cloud means. But people are looking for ways that they can move things from capital expenditures into operational expenditures. And the cloud is one way that people can start to think about that. They can really adopt a, a, um, really a pay-as-you-go model to resource consumption. Now, we're not necessarily seeing just um, everybody jump, dump everything into the cloud. I think, you know, back in 2007, seven eight when the cloud was kind of beginning to, the hype factor was really through the roof, IT was, often afraid of, oh my God, my job. How many of you worked in organizations where people were worried about, okay, the cloud's gonna take me out? Anybody? Right now. You're worried about that right now? I'm not worried about it, but people, there's a lot of people in my organization that I think are worried about that. Well, friends are worried about it, you coach <laughs> I'm, I'm asking for a friend. I'm, I'm the, well. What are you? I'm a, uh, I'm a cloud engineer. <laughs> Can you get out? No, just kidding. Um, and I'm the only DevOps engineer in SuperValley. Yeah, my God. I, I really did you really just say DevOps and cloud in the same sentence? I did. Okay. You know, they're both real nebulous terms. Oh, that was bad. That was a bad pun. <laughs> What's that? A little That's right. So. The cloud is actually a real thing, and as we look forward to the future, I don't think we're going to see a day when everybody's running everything in the public cloud in, in our lifetimes, to be perfectly honest. There's too many challenges that still need to be overcome for organizations to run everything in the cloud. And number one, believe it or not, is bandwidth. I, I did a consulting gig last year in Flagstaff, Arizona. How many of you have been to Flagstaff? It's, it's, not, it's a smallish city, but it's a city really nice, and they have exactly one run of fiber optic cabling serving the entire city. 
literally one run. I didn't know that. I asked the CIO at the college I was working with, asking him, why are you not going to Office 365? For colleges, it's a no-brainer. And he said, because if the, if the internet connection goes down, we don't have any email. And I'm, okay, well, you're, just get a dual, just get a second one, right? We can't, because there's only one fiber run for the entire city, cell service, TV service, everything runs on that one, that one fiber run. He goes, if it gets cut, we're down. Two weeks later, it got cut. In Phoenix, someone went and cut it, and the city of Flagstaff was down until they fixed it. The entire city, that mission was the entire city? I spent some time this summer in Page, Arizona, where they have like five megabits serving the city. Not kidding. It was, I, I would rather not live than have to live with that. But, so there's real problems with just thinking we're gonna dump everything, dump everything in the cloud. Now those situations will get fixed over time, but at the same time, we also have latency sensitive applications we have to keep on site. We have regulatory issues that are forcing us to keep certain things on site. We have security um, needs that are help forcing us to keep everything on site. And we have just pure logistics. If you have a network in your organization, you must have some servers in some way, shape, or form. Something has to provide compute for things like DNS and DHCP and all the other stuff in your organization. So you're gonna, by necessity, have something local if you're an organization of any size at all. So you're always gonna have some local presence in your local data center. So at the very worst, we're looking at um, a hybrid cloud scenario where we use some things in the public cloud and some things in, the, in, a, in a private data center environment. How many of you are doing something with cloud right now? Okay, how many of you are running Office 365 or Google Apps? How many, and put your hands down. How many of you did not answer yes to the first question, but you did to the second? So you're running the cloud in some way, shape, or form. It's a SaaS type environment, but it's still a cloud service. So when we really think about it, hybrid is the future of the data center. So I found this graphic that I thought was really awesome, actually. People still don't understand what all of these stuff mean, means. So we say traditional on-premises. So if you think about this as a pizza, this is you buying all the ingredients and making a pizza at home. When we think about infrastructure as a service, you go to some place like, what's the place, Papa Murphy's? Is that the one where you go pick up the frozen pizza and take it home and cook it, right? And then pizza delivered is Pizza Hut, if you like Pizza Hut. Um, bringing a pizza to your house, or you go to a decent pizza place that's not Pizza Hut, and you dine out. That's the same way we think about with cloud service providers. I love this graphic, so I just wanted to share it, because um, I think it really helps people better understand what is meant by all these different potential um, services we can, we can uh, consume in IT these days. So what else is happening? We have, as I mentioned before, data analytics and business intelligence that business is looking for. The internet of insecurity. Automation and orchestration are hot on the, on the trails of all this stuff today as well. We have machine learning technologies making a huge rise in the, in the market. Um, in fact, there was a story this morning about a delivery truck, a self-driving delivery truck made a delivery, I think in something, California maybe, this morning. Um, all that stuff requires high levels of machine learning, high levels of automation orchestration, lots of analytics. They're coming together of tons of things to happen with raw compute power to be able to make that kind of stuff happen. And I'm running out of time. Okay, I got a few minutes left. So the question you might be asking is, okay, well now I'm depressed. Anybody depressed yet? Okay, don't be. There's lots of things you can do. This is not the end of the world. There's just some challenges we have to overcome. And like I said, I think there's some technologies that we are see on the market today, converge, type of converge, cloud, all kinds of things that can help us rethink the way we actually do business in IT to help us meet the seemingly um, conflicting goals of decreasing, resource, decreasing our resource consumption at the same, the financial resource consumption at the same time that we are meeting the needs of the business more quickly. So, first of all, embrace shadow IT. Now that goes along, that doesn't necessarily jive with what I just heard from you guys. I think in a lot of cases though that Unmanaged shadow IT is a symptom of a larger problem. And, and you probably had to, some of, the, some of those shadow IT systems, you probably had to figure out a way to implement, put into your core environment, right? Because they become business critical. So the problem was someone felt like either this isn't getting done or I don't really want to ask IT, so I'm just gonna do it myself. So we have to do it. So it's user needs, user needs that are not being met in some way, shape, or form. So as CIOs, there's, 
a balance that has to be struck between just saying turn it off and we need to embrace this. We, need to, we actually need to find a way to support this. We also have end users that are far more savvy than they used to be. You know, when I started in IT, end users, I mean, they weren't even required to know how to use a keyboard. Um, end users today are pretty smart. I know that that's hard to believe with some. But end users today are really smart, and a lot of them know exactly what they're doing and what they're looking for. And we have to listen to them more than we did before. And when we think about security in the realm of shadow IT, I'm going to use Stephen Foskett's favorite source, Gartner. He hates Gartner. Don't you, Stephen? I think I've heard you say those words. Um, <laughs> never said it, never. <laughs> never said it. Wait, I've got you on videotape. Where'd you hear that? <laughs> I'm going to sue you. Um, <laughs> sorry. By 2020, a third of successful attacks experienced by enterprises will be on their shadow IT resources. And why is that? Because they know how, what they want to do, but they don't know how to secure their stuff. Right? Security is freaking hard when you even know what you're doing. It's actually harder when you don't know. If you, it's dangerous when you don't know, because you don't know where you're vulnerable. Consider alternative architectures. Think about things like uh, conversion, hybrid conversion infrastructure. Think about hybrid cloud. Think about looking at multi-cloud tools that can help you manage um, if you want to you know, use uh, Office 65 for some things, Azure for other things, you want to use Amazon for other things yet. Think about tools that can help you shift workloads between public cloud systems and things like that. Make sure you understand the challenges and the economics in cloud as well. The economics are what CFOs love. Um, they really like um, this pay-as-you-go type thing that has theoretically no operation, I'm sorry, no capital cost. The problem is it doesn't have a ceiling either. Um, the ceiling for a cloud provider is the limit of your credit card. Um, so people can easily consume more than they actually can afford at some point. Think differently as well. You know, there used to be a build versus buy type uh, uh, process we had to go through. Today it's build versus buy versus rent. And then the second one, this is a constant swing in IT. Um, we go from centralized to distributed, and we're eventually going to go back to centralized. Um, how long do you think it'll be before we go back to centralized? We're, we're, we're going more distributed today. It probably won't be that long, right? When the mainframe days were centralized, land days were decentralized. We tried to centralize the own virtualization. We're, trying to, we're now trying to distribute again when we think about cloud and things like that. And rather than just managing change, we actually have to act actively help the business innovate to move forward. You know, I, um, to make routine things routine, one of the guys I used to work for a long time ago, that was one of his favorite phrases, and I loved it. Because it's basically, if you're going to do something all the time, it should, it should be repeatable. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't be reinventing the wheel all the time. So we want to think about you know, making sure we have budgets that are predictable. We want to have workloads that are predictable. Um, we want to have tactical plans that can help us get to a predictable state. There's all kinds of things we need to do to make the routine things that we do routine. Um, the same person I worked for, I think this is really important. Uh, so if you listen to nothing else I said, listen to this part. And then I'll end pretty quick, because I think I'm just about out of time, right? OK. So I used to work for Hamilton College in upstate New York. And every morning, we had what he called a standing meeting, where the entire department was like 24 people got together in the conference room. We just stood, and we just told each other what was happening for the day. And that one morning, our email minute, I was a director of networks and systems at the time. And for whatever reason, the email system was managed by the help desk manager. Don't know why. It just was the way that it kind of grew up. She came in one morning and said, we have a crisis. The email system is down. And my boss, who was the IT director at the time, said, looked at her and said, who died? And she said, nobody died. What? And he said, then we don't have a crisis. And that story really stuck with me. Is for, no matter how bad things get, unless you're in health, how many of you are in healthcare? OK, you can cover your ears for this part. No matter how bad things get, people are probably not dying. right? So just maintain some perspective on what you're doing so that you can sort of put this in the box it belongs in. So if people aren't dying, Stay calm, stay cool, stay collected.